Man, Danny Phantom deserved way more games than it received. It's one of Nickelodeon's rare franchises that actually has a real focus on action and combat, so the show is perfectly ready to jump into the gaming space. But for some reason, Danny only showed up for his own game twice, both times being relegated to handhelds. He is playable and a major part of all four Nicktoons Unite games, but that's not really the same as getting a full-fledged console game based just on Danny Phantom. In a different timeline, we easily could have got as many Danny Phantom games as we did Ben 10 games over on the Cartoon Network side of things, but the fact that the show only ran for three years made sure that never happened. The actual reasons behind Danny Phantom's cancellation are shrouded in a lot of hearsay and mystery, but if I was to guess, I'd probably just put it down to Nickelodeon being mad it wasn't pulling in Spongebob level ratings. I'm Brandon and I'll be your captain for our voyage through Nickelodeon video game history. Released on September 18, 2006, amidst what was essentially a year-long hiatus for the show, Danny Phantom Urban Jungle came exclusively to the GBA and Nintendo DS. These two games are essentially the exact same title, but tweaked a bit to fit their specific platforms. Obviously, the GBA version couldn't take advantage of the touchscreen, and the DS version leans more heavily into a 3D look for its visuals. But after playing the DS version to completion and watching playthroughs of the GBA version, I decided that they weren't unique enough to be reviewed separately. Yell at me in the comments below if you think I'm wrong. If you're an avid Danny Phantom fan, you'll recognize that the title of this game is the same as the title of an episode, the same thing that Ultimate Enemy did. But this time basing a game around an episode makes a little less sense. Ultimate Enemy was a big two-part event that had quite an epic plot, and it changed up the status quo of the show a bit. In comparison, Urban Jungle is a regular 22-minute episode of the show. It does guest star Mark Hamill as the main villain, but that hardly matters when this game is stuck on handhelds and we don't get any voice acting. If they were looking to make a game based specifically on a story told in the show, I'm not sure why they didn't go with Reality Trip, which was the two-part finale to Season 2, which aired about three months before this game came out. Also, Urban Jungle is the sixth episode of Danny Phantom Season 3 in production order, but it aired first, randomly being plonked out on October 9, 2006, a month after the game released, and nine months before any other Season 3 episodes would start airing. Danny Phantom experts, please hit me up in the comments below if there's any actual explanation for any of this. Both versions of Urban Jungle were developed by Altron, the clingy boyfriend of Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network video game history. We just cannot get rid of these guys. If you've followed the channel for a while, you're probably sick of me explaining this, so I'll speed through it. Altron is a developer based in Japan who became the go-to team for handheld licensed games, at least when it comes to cartoons. Altron games I've covered so far include Robot Rampage, Hey Arnold the Movie, Enter the Cleft, Freeze Frame Frenzy, Express Yourself, The Great Juju Challenge on DS, and Kaznapped. They also developed the first disappointing Danny Phantom game, and they'll go on to make at least four more Nickelodeon games. Some of those games I mentioned are pretty good, so there's always a little bit of hope when Altron is in control. But looking at the critical consensus, it seems Urban Jungle is what the kids call mid. The DS version ended up on an okay 6.1 out of 10 average, while the GBA had a slightly worse 5.7 out of 10. For the second and final time, we're going to head to the Ghost Zone. Will this be the Danny Phantom game we deserved? Obligatory shmup section? Nah, this is an obligatory shmup game. Danny can fly and shoot things out of his body, so just like the Powerpuff Girls got one, Danny Phantom's final game ends up being a full-fledged shmup. To kick the game off, you get a neat little slideshow showing off all of Danny's powers before picking your difficulty level and jumping into the game. Danny and the gang are reminiscing about fighting Lunch Lady, and this acts as your tutorial stage. And trust me, you're going to need a tutorial for the amount of stuff going on in this game. 
Before you even get to start a level, you have to pick a loadout of power-ups. You can choose three of these per level, but to start off you only have access to three, so you'll be playing with invisibility, a boomerang attack, and the Fenton Thermos, which allows you to suck up ghosts. Once you start flying through the level, you'll find that Danny has a basic attack and a charge attack, which I honestly completely forgot I even had. L will cycle through your power-ups and B will activate them. Using these powers is tied to the green gauge in the top left, and to refill it you will actually have to absorb attacks from enemies. Danny can change his polarity here, which is essentially what colour he glows. Matching this to an enemy's attack will absorb it, meaning you take no damage and you refill your power-up gauge. It's an interesting idea and makes the standard shmup gameplay feel a little deeper. Danny can also switch up his regular attack. From time to time an item will float on screen and when you pick it up it will give you a new type of attack, which you can switch between on the fly. There are laser, homing and pierce attack types to add to your arsenal, and which one you receive is determined by the letter on the item when you pick it up. But adding a further twist is that every time you shoot this item, the letter changes. This means it actually can be quite tricky to grab the type of attack you really want, especially when you have all of the attacks except one. Trying to balance killing enemies and not taking damage, while also trying to get the item to switch to what you want, is a tough juggling act at times. Cycling through these attacks is really easy too. You can switch instantly to the attack you want via the touchscreen, or you can scroll through the attacks by pressing X. But you better believe the on-screen items you need to collect don't end there. Next, we've got the attack power items. Collecting these green things raises the level of Danny's attack, giving you increased power, greater spread, stuff like that. There are four levels of attack power, and each time you lose a life, you'll go down a level, with the touchscreen showing which level you're currently at. Then finally, you've got your health items. Picking these up will store them on the touchscreen for you to use whenever you see fit, rather than just activating instantly. And the last mechanic that gets dumped on you via this overwhelming tutorial is the Fenton Thermos's functionality. If you get in close, you can suck up ghosts, which will send a power up to the bottom screen and can be activated just like the health items. It's basic stuff like refilling your power up gauge. Danny gets a few different Fenton gadgets that can suck up ghosts in slightly different manners, but I can honestly say I didn't really engage with this. Sucking up ghosts sends them to your ghost gallery, and if you want to unlock the boss rush mode, you'll need to collect a bunch of them. Once you've hopefully wrapped your head around all of that in just the short tutorial stage, you're onto the main course, where Danny has to square off against undergrowth just like in the episode. The shmup gameplay here is actually a pretty tough juggling act, even compared to a lot of the other shmups I've played. You're constantly bouncing from killing enemies to managing what type of attack you're using, changing Danny's polarity, utilizing your power-ups. It can be a little overwhelming. I honestly can't imagine this being a fun experience for kids. Maybe the easy difficulty would be the sweet spot for them, but I played on the standard normal difficulty, and while I didn't find Urban Jungle ever to be hard, it was a bit much. On top of that, you don't just have to worry about enemies hurting you in this game, the levels themselves are a hazard to Danny. Taking advantage of Danny's ghostly abilities, Ultron makes the player turn invisible to avoid obstacles like walls and doors in pretty much every level. Hitting these things does a surprising amount of damage to Danny, and they're genuinely a bigger threat than the ghost fodder you're plowing through. This decision also removes a lot of the choice when it comes to picking Danny's loadout. The invisibility power up is necessary for most levels, so you have like 33% less flexibility when it comes to choosing how Danny will tackle a stage. To me, it feels like invisibility should have been an inherent power that Danny always has, rather than something that you equipped via the loadout system. As you progress, Danny will add fire and ice type attacks to his power up selection, which are quite powerful, but also a missed opportunity from Altron. Seeing this, I assumed enemies would have particular weaknesses or something like that, and picking the perfect loadout for a level would optimize your run. But this doesn't exist, and it feels like the power of these attacks are identical, so just pick whichever one you think is the coolest. There's no strategy to it, at least as far as I can tell. The attack power also causes some issues. Stages become so easy once you reach max attack power, 
to the point where you just melt every enemy. In fact, you even start melting enemies before they get onto the screen. You can kill them before they even enter your vision. If Ultron decided precisely when and where these attack power items would drop, they could have manipulated how quickly the player could grow in strength and make sure entire levels aren't a walk in the Amity Park. But whether an enemy drops one of these appears to be 100% RNG, so sometimes you'd have all four attack types and a maxed out power level 30 seconds into the stage. The fact that the game never gives the player extra lives seems like it might be a way to reintroduce some difficulty, and it does slightly. Losing all four of your lives sends you back to the start of a level, but for some reason Ultron decided to have the amount of lives you have carry over from level to level, rather than resetting them when you begin a new stage. With this setup, if you've only got one or two lives when starting a level, it makes no sense to not just immediately kill yourself so you can reset with a full batch of lives. Why do I want to risk getting to the end of the level and losing my one life just to start over from scratch, when I have such an easy way to start fresh with four lives and give myself the best chance possible to beat the stage? Maybe this has a big impact on your end of stage score, but these scores seemed pretty meaningless in the scheme of the game, so who cares? Always standing in the way of you moving on to the next stage is a boss battle. These are pathetically easy, and a lot of that comes down to the decision to make Danny's power-up gauge be refilled by absorbing attacks. With just one enemy to deal with in these boss battles, it becomes super easy to absorb attacks. You end up just having your best powers available for 90% of these fights, so you chip down their health in no time. The one exception is the pirate ship boss battle, which isn't hard, but it does take way too long. And you've also got bonus stages, which aren't really bonus stages as they're just given to every player. They do change up the gameplay ever so slightly by adding in gimmicks. You'll get a level that asks you to only collect points by absorbing attacks, or to survive without dying for a certain time limit. Failing these bonus stages has no consequences, and they don't seem to add any value to the game, other than adding to your overall score. The real change in gameplay comes when you switch from side-scrolling as Danny to flying away from the camera in the Fenton Flyer. The mechanics here naturally change due to the way you're traveling being altered, and in general I found these levels to be much harder than the regular Danny levels. While the gameplay is a mixed bag, I have to give my props to Altron for the visuals and the soundtrack. The stages look really nice in the DS version, and one of the best things they do is constantly switching up the color palette. Stages have slight tweaks between them, like adding in unique obstacles, or briefly changing the direction that it scrolls in, but these wouldn't have been enough to make them feel distinct and different. But the dominant color changing in practically every stage does some mental juju, and it makes you feel like you're actually playing something different, when at the end of the day, pretty much every stage in a shmup is the same. The backgrounds having a 3D element to them is pretty cool, and a use of the DS's upgraded power over the GBA, and they even made these 3D environments for these dialogue scenes. Ultron could have gotten away with just making everything like flat 2D, but it feels like they went the extra mile here. And then you've got the banger soundtrack. I feel like Ultron games can generally be relied upon to at least have some great songs, and Urban Jungle is no different. The standout here has gotta be the theme for World 5. Receiving incoming transmission. Danny Phantom Urban Jungle isn't an incredible game and doesn't make the fact we never got a console game sting any less. But it is a serviceable shmup and a massive step up over Ultron's first attempt with Ultimate Enemy. It's got its flaws and a lot of the mechanics they introduced to try and make this a deeper experience accidentally clash to make the game easier or clunkier than intended. At the end of the day though, I had an enjoyable experience and would really recommend you check it out. 
I honestly think the review average for the DS game is a little low. I'd say this is more in line with a 7 out of 10. And while I can't specifically speak for the GBA version, I can't see why it would be so bad that it's worth being called a 5 out of 10. In fact, I would have thought removing the touchscreen elements would streamline some of the gameplay and mechanics to make the game smoother and a little less hectic to manage. Depending on the implementation, I could see the core gameplay being more fun. We'll still see Danny across Nick's many crossover games, but for his final solo outing, Urban Jungle is a respectable effort. Next time we'll be encountering Danny again, but this time he'll be burning rubber in Nickelodeon Kart Races 3. It's no secret that I loved Nickelodeon Kart Races 2, and from the looks of things, Slime Speedway could be even better. Seeing as 2 was already a great platform to build upon, Slime Speedway doesn't need to take an enormous leap like we saw between 1 and 2. Instead, the changes and improvements seem to be a little more incremental. And of course, as is tradition, they're taking a heaping dose of inspiration from Mario Kart. Will Nick Kart Races 3 continue the great run of cartoon crossover games we've seen recently? To make sure you don't miss that video or any of my upcoming reviews, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And to stay up to date with everything that's happening with the channel, jump over to Twitter and give me a follow.